Fox News is for people who are unhealthy or want to be unhealthy. You watch Fox News because you're going to die and you don't want to die alone. You want everyone to die with you. So no Medicare for all. Climate change. It's not real. More guns, more guns, more war, more cops shooting people in the back because let's all die together. I I don't want to be alone, which is why there is no Fox News in Canada or Great Britain. Nobody watches it in Canada or Great Britain. They tried. People think that it's banned in Canada. It's not. They try to put Fox News on in Canada and in Great Britain. Nobody watches it. Canadians, the Brits, Canadians and Brits, they don't want any part of Fox News because those countries have something resembling universal health care, which means they lack the medical preconditions that make Fox News such a soft entry point into the brains of untreated mental deficients. You're listening to The David Feldman Show, you happy, self-actualized hump. Why would you watch Fox News if you can afford to see a doctor? That's why nobody in Canada or Great Britain watches Fox News. They don't want to die. And it's not just the decimation of our health care that makes Fox News so appealing to some, some senior citizens in America. There's also the eradication of our social safety net. Most senior citizens in America are struggling to make rent, fill their prescriptions, and eat. So most, a vast preponderance of senior citizens, are smart enough, are self-aware enough to rely on others. Then there are the handful of seniors who, instead of turning to others, turn to Fox News, and they're taught it's a dog-eat-dog world. Or if you're a senior citizen watching Fox News, a man-eats-dog world. We're only talking about a couple of million here in America, only a couple of million senior citizens who watch Fox News, but that's all it takes to create a movement. All it takes is a a couple of million old, lonely, angry citizens, uh, senior citizens, just takes a couple of million old, lonely, angry senior citizens with simultaneously too much and not enough time on their hands to get just stupid enough, to get just angry enough, to get just frightened enough, to get tricked into thinking Things like humans are not responsible for climate change if it's real. Local police aren't racist, but the FBI is. They hate Christians and white people. And, you know, guns mean fewer gun death. And vaccines are more dangerous than COVID. It's a movement of senior citizens who believe this. And there's just enough for them to keep the Republican Party humming along. Let me give a proper introduction. Colleen Worthman is a brilliant, brilliant actress and comedy writer. She's written for all your favorite people in television shows, The Daily Show, The Nightly Show, The Mark Twain Prize, The White House. All the things that you never watched but have heard is good. The the White House Correspondence Center, the Oscars, the Emmys, the Comedy Central roasts, Steve Martin. Colleen is a ratings death. Michael Moore, she has written for everybody and she doesn't dish. So don't, we're not going to get any gossip, but uh, I love everyone in show business. Because how can you not? How can you not (laughs) love everybody? How can you not? And she is also more importantly, a, a teacher who works with our veterans, who teaches writing to our veterans and that's true through wounded warriors project and writers guild initiative that's true right so i want to ask you about that okay and before it gets ugly wait colleen what kind of writing do you teach to veterans 
Like uh, TV ring? Have we talked about this? This is a new thing? Let me introduce Liam McEnany first, and then the two of you can take over. Liam McEnany. Do they write, do they write spec scripts like, dude, where's my leg? Liam, Ma- <laughs> Liam McEnany is a brilliant stand-up comedian. Sorry. He, Office Hours started with him. The 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 uh, origins of Office Hours were he yeah. he and I used to take listener questions, right? And Liam would crap on all the listeners. This was you know no, 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 no. first first I would say Medicare for all would never pass with the American public, and then David would rant at me for forty five minutes. <laughs> then we would take listener questions. And we got to know people just through their questions each week. And then Zoom came into being and Liam and I hosted office hours to meet the listeners. And then one thing. So what happened was then David brought a guest on he'd rather talk to. And he ignored me for 45 minutes till I realized that uh, David just wanted to talk about uh, FDR. Right. (laughs) I, I, I have a problem keeping friends, but let me just, and then, then, so we had a falling out. Well, we, I wouldn't say it was a falling out. I was just, it was more like, I have so much to do in this life. Right. But let sitting me, in a bathroom. You're, you're, on in college, you're in college, you're in film school, you're making now, films yeah. like every single day. This, Your Instagram is exhausting, Liam. T- brag about <laughs> Colleen, brag about Liam, because it really is a great story. Tell you know what, what he's doing. I would love to. Well, during the pandemic, Liam and I were writing a script together and he mentioned that he uh, had never gone to college. I mean, we we had talked about that before that he never he really didn't college. have to tell anybody we knew. <laughs> I mean, tell. it was implicit, <laughs> but fine. he vocalized it. <laughs> That being said, he got into LACC. He Which finished his, asso- he got his associates, as right. Gary What's-His-Face would say. And then he applies to basically the best film school in the nation. That's USC, University of Southern California, gets in, gets a uh-huh. scholarship, even though he's a white man. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I might have to. That's how good he is. (laughs) That's how good he is. Right. He got Um, a white, even though he's the devil, even though he's a white devil. (laughs) The blue eye, yeah. He got a scholarship. And he's old. I put put black on my. He's an old white man. I'm old white man, yeah. But I put. I put 26 year old black woman on my form. All right. So that's not a problem. This is. Oh, this is kind of like soul man. That terrible movie. Yeah. So you're going. Oh, we made David uncomfortable. Are we embarrassing (laughs) you in front of your other friends, David? No, no. Uh, uh, This is how David, by the way, if you're listening, if you, you've never understood this before, this is how David talks in the writer's room when the camera's not on. Mm -hmm. Uh, What we and Colleen just said. And now David has to pretend that he's uncomfortable and doesn't like it. Right. No, that's if that would be me being polite in a writer's room. Can I ask you a question, David? (laughs) Speaking of which, I I have a question. Uh, So you, you, and this is true, you're like one of the best joke writers working today, right? Like that's just a fact. You're you're a great joke writer. Facts. No. And yet, in the last segment, you said if you could work in any era in show business, it would be the silent era. When the one thing they didn't need was joke writers. The, the, the gag like, men. What do you? They, 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 are you kidding? They had gag dude. men. So you're saying you write Pratt Falls for Triumph and like uh, Pies and like Harold things? Lloyd and Buster Keaton. It's not. Have you watched a silent Colleen? Those guys. They had comedy writing rooms. If you go. Oh yeah. To, no, I know. Yeah, yeah, but you're like this great. You're great at like these arch observational jokes. That like really cut to the heart of the matter, right? And so I can't imagine you writing like fucking Harold Lloyd dangling off of a clock face. I, I can. I, I, I to me that had to have been the most because it was all brand new. Like, wouldn't you have loved to have been in the early days of radio and the early days of television when it was just yeah. starting out and there were no rules? Yeah, when it was like plays. Yeah. yeah. On yeah, TV, when you- like, yeah. When you could write a six-minute sketch with three punchlines, yeah, like, those like guys, 
<laughs> Dude, fucking <laughs> like on the those Flip guys Wilson had a maid. show. Yeah. Colleen, yeah. when would if you could go into a time machine mm -hmm. and work in the 20th century, Ooh. have like a 20 year run. And by the way, I have another answer to this. There's another fantasy. You give me a, tw a 20 year period that you would love to work and in what industry in the business? I would like to work on a bunch of Norman Lear sitcoms back to back Ooh. and then work on Cheers. Ooh. So you okay. so you want to be a man in this scenario? Uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, I already have a penis. <laughs> and I'm already losing yeah, my hair, so it would be perfect. <laughs> the penis is your husband's. It's in a jar on the shelf behind you. All right. Liam, <laughs> Liam, what, give me the tw a 20 year period. I actually if you're lucky that. in show business, you get 20. If you're lucky if you get one good year, but there are mm -hmm. some people who get 20 great years in show business. What would what would you like? Give me 20 great I would years. Say I would love to have been like a Woody Allen type guy who just did like smart comedy. No, I'm asking for a period. Show. I'm asking for a period. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not I haven't finished yet. Right. So like that's how you start. And then you get into TV writing and then you get into film writing. And then if you get into film like film directing and that's the kind of like 20 year like Mm. career that you could have being a smart comedian who does television a lot you know through in that you could be on johnny carson in the 70s because suddenly you're like you've been in comedy forever and people won't interrupt you if it takes you 10 minutes to finish a joke like just the, that was an amazing time to be a smart lazy comedian right i the silent movie as a as a comedy writer or just an observer the silent air but to me I think the most exciting time or another exciting time would be to be a, a, a comedian who starts out right after World War II, Ooh. who comes back. I think there's a 20 year period. It doesn't end well. I figured it ends in 68, <laughs> 67, where the right. where everything is changing and you can't, you know, mm -hmm. you're Opening totally world. irrelevant. Opening. But I think Opening there's Jackie Green in the lounges in Las Vegas. kind of. <laughs> well, I, I think there's this there there. The unions were strong and I think you could live in New York. I think mm. there were a lot of comedians who could work in oh, radio, yeah. theater, clubs, uh, little television. They could live in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And there was a sense of uh, that entitlement that doesn't exist anymore, that if you were a white man and straight, uh, you could expect, you, you know, you just accepted the world. Set up punchlines and. Yeah. Well, David, here's how I see that going for you. Tell me, <laughs> tell me if I'm ever, if I'm off base here. So right after World War II. Yeah. Um, but it's before social media. So nobody questions why you didn't serve our country. Yeah. Uh, you just kind of. I had other start. priorities. You had other priorities, like you had to sit and write jokes and, you know, screw just, guys I, I was for overseas. the war. I was for the war. But my <laughs> right, career. We were, you know, I, I, I was selling bonds at home. Right. You were you were you were in the bond or bonds or whatever you want to call it. The bond, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so then uh, you start doing like little nightclubs. Yes. In your little suit. Mm -hmm. And your your whole goal is just to work up to the day when you can play uh, the Copa, right? You're like, I know I've made it if I can play the Copa, but you're stuck, you know, in the Blue Angel circuit. Maybe you, uh, yeah. you know, maybe you play some some of the strip clubs and the gay clubs. Uh, I would have just settled for that. <laughs> but then you you uh, you see these two mafia guys shoot a man to death. Yes, and you keep your mouth shut. Right. You of don't course. ever mention it. They don't ever mention it to you. Mm -hmm. And then one day, a few months down the line, one of them's like, hey, we have a friend uh, who runs who books a TV show. Would you like to be on the Milton Berle show? Uh -huh. Let's go start the theater. And you're like, sure, why not? I've got nothing going for me. The, you know, the government shut off my gas. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I live in a cold water flat down in the Lower East Side. An SRO. Uh, I'm about <laughs> to quit. What's that? An SRO. And that's our yes. Yeah. Standing room only. She's not, she doesn't mean. <laughs> no, you single have, occupancy. Right. 
You have a closed But, but your single point. room occupancy is standing room only. It's basically a wooden closet. It's very narrow. It's actually a locker at yeah. Port Authority. Hey, uh, who's actually, pooping in the aisles? Me. Yeah, you have a Murphy. You have a Murphy couch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so you're like you know you have a clothesline running through your apartment, right? Yes. So like you're like. Okay, fine. I'll, that he I'll tries to I hang can. himself from, and then <laughs> right. like, it comes loose from. Right. Right. To, to <laughs> heighten my to... neighbor's orgasm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know, David. Uh, so generous. The knock, on the, <laughs> knock on the door comes when David has his head in the ice box trying to commit suicide. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. So you're like, oh fuck! Thank God, I have some money to eat tonight. I don't have to go line up at the at the church downtown and get some stale bread and a cup of soup. <laughs> so you're on the Texco star theater, right? Things start yes. going well for you. You're invited on the Ed Sullivan show. Your act is so pedestrian and hack that it kills. Thank you. Like just absolutely not an original <laughs> thank, thought thank. comes out of your mouth. Oh, bless uh, your soul. So you're like one of Ed's favorites, mm -hmm. right? Suddenly you're playing the Copa, your dream of all dreams. Then your second uh, appearance on the Ed Sullivan show, you think the camera's not on yet. So you say, screw that Catholic John F. Kennedy. Your career is over. Well, what about and my I, what about the girl I'm dating, the woman I'm dating, who is, oh yes. is part of uh, Common Turn? You know what? It turns out that Common Turn? friends from the mafia. They're they're taking care of her while you're out of town on tour. Oh, and cool. in fact, they're booking you into nightclubs and Playboy clubs in Chicago, Grand Rapids, uh, all across the U.S. so that they can uh, have these affairs with your girlfriend while you're out of town. You know uh, what my fantasy like, is? It, uh oh, it, my fantasy <laughs> is being called being called before the House on American Activities Committee. Oh, wow. and, and they ask me to name names. And I say, would I you do. like them alphabetically? Would you like me to start <laughs> at A or Z? We can work backwards or forwards, but I got a list here. I'll give you. Do you want Arnheit or zero first? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. That, that, so anyway, that's, that's how I. Well, let's it talk about. Let, 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 let's talk about teaching writing to our warriors. Oh, good. Sure. That's something we can and, both and the, answer. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, with all that's going on in the world, the, there is no sympathy for artists. There, there's resentment towards anybody who has the need to express themselves. Like if you say to people, you know, I'm a comedian, it's not going out, it's not going well. They go, F you, I have a real job. You know, who cares about your need to express you? You know, you. What is why is express why is writing so important? Why do some people have to write? And how does it help veterans when they commit to writing? And I, I would assume they're not even writing about their experiences overseas. I would assume many of them just write stories that it's not just the trauma. They're just creative and they want to write. Why is writing uh, therapeutic for all of us? And how do you see that working with veterans? Um, I don't know that I can answer the first part of like what makes people need to write, but I can tell you from working with Wounded Warriors Project that um, the veterans sometimes, but rarely write about their wartime experiences. They tend to write about other things. Um, because so much of their life has been defined and shaped by war that they enjoy being identified with other things. Right. Um, and, it, you know, sort of working with other aspects of their humanity, which I think was in some cases extremely compromised uh, when they were fighting. Um or because they feel uh, they, they've had a lot of conflicting thoughts about like the wars that they were involved in, namely Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, so 
it, it's I really love teaching vets because they are uh, are incredibly open and disciplined. Like if you said if you tell them, you know what, the more you go for it, the more reward you're going to get. They fucking go for it. And the writing right. is amazing. Speak to me about the discipline of writing and, and their discipline. What, how do they deal with, like, I don't have writer's block. I know people I've worked for wish I had writer's <laughs> block. <laughs> but I, uh, but I understand that writer's block, some people have, I, I well, we can talk about writer's block another time, but do they get writer's block or do they work do they do the reps? Do they do the scales, the discipline of just working the muscle? Well, the kind of stuff I do with them are like prompts and short exercises. And then we go to longer bits of writing, like 20 minutes, 30, 45 minutes at a time with like a sort of framework in gear. But um, they, I think, don't afford themselves the luxury of fu fucking around because they've signed up for these workshops and they really want to do it. Um, there's not a lot of dithering. There's not a lot of like staring off into space or like futzing, like eating snacks or, you know, picking up the phone. They're just like, if you tell them, all right, you got 45 minutes, keep that pen moving no matter what. If you need to shake out your hand once, do it, but jump right back in. That's what they do. Wow. And, and you, you run know, writing rooms. Yes. What, would, what would it be like if... You had a writing room filled with veterans. I would be delighted. I would be delighted. Because they're really good at taking feedback. They're really good at. Um, like, Giving up the self. Yes. Yeah. They sublimate themselves to the work. And uh, they're very grateful and well-mannered. They're like really good citizens. <laughs> right. You know? You know, I, I'm reading, uh, I stand by this. Uh, one of the best books I've read is Spare by Prince Harry. Oh. It's, it's ghost written by one of the best writers out there. George Clooney uses him all the time. Anyway, he Harry describes, I, I like Meghan and Harry. I do. I'm sorry. Mm. You know, and, and the stuff in Afghanistan, I, is too tough. To, I skim through that. It's mm -hmm. wrong. Uh but uh, he talks about giving up the self mm. that you you in boot camp, they just get rid of that ego. He says there is nothing more exhilarating. You're, you're running 12 hours a day working out and they just strip you of who you think you are. And there's no greater feeling. I have listen, I, I to compare it to a writing room. The closest I I'm ashamed to say this because it's but the closest I've gotten to that uh, is a writing room where we or, you know, it, I know that musicians get that when they're playing with each other. Mm -hmm. But when you when you I, and I guess you could get that through sports. Have you ever gotten that working <laughs> on a television show in a writing room where you were literally surrendered yourself and gave it all to the team it's really hard to do right yeah i mean i think what you're i get i'm getting the sense that what you're talking about is the concept of flow things that like <laughs> like peak experiences where like all that matters is like what you're doing in the moment and like you're challenged but not too much and you feel like you're in the zone and like it just feels like like all of a sudden all this time has passed and you're like whoa there's a great book about flow that came out in the early nineties. It's called really kiss my grits. <laughs> yeah. Flow from Alice wrote it. <laughs> We're so weird that we, she was also a clinical psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> Liam, we, we, we have five minutes. So Liam, I want to uh, find no, out I've, about the I've dog. I've never taught veterans how to write. What are you learning at USC film school? Uh, what, what have you what do you know now about writing? And then and then we'll find out about the dog and which is the most important thing, the dog. But dog. I want to oh, okay. I want to hear about the dog in a second. Oh, right. But tell me about uh, you are. That's how they get you, by the way, Colleen. 
I have I friends know. that are fostering a dog right now. And all they do is take pictures of this dog. One of them's in New York working. And she's posting pictures on Instagram of a uh, FaceTime she had with the fucking dog. Tell like, me about oh, you. We'll, we'll clearly get the dog, dog in a second. I want to hear about USC Film School. And you have your a career, a writing sure. career, a stand-up career. What did you think you knew before you went to USC? And what do you know now that you didn't know? Uh, well, you know, part of the reason I'm at USC is because I, over the pandemic, I taught myself screenwriting. You know, because it's like, I thought I understood comedy writing and I really did not. And I thought I understood story structure and I really did not. And then I got to USC and I learned like, there's so much more to story structure than I even had learned during lockdown. Um, but, you know, it's interesting is I'm on the, I'm on the production track, which means they're emphasizing more directing, producing, sound, uh, you know, cinematography, like kind of like they're giving me a well-rounded education in terms of the production side of it. But the writing, the writing track is its own, its own kind of like field. Right. And that, that it's like, I just don't have the time right now to take those classes. That's why you, you know, that's what an MFA is for. Well, <laughs> Say what if I go to if I go to school for two more years than I'm doing right now, then shoot me in the fucking face. All right. It is a lot. I would work. actually love to go back to school. I would love to shoot him in the fucking face. Oh, oh. <laughs> fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. Well, uh, we have a question. Well, from guess John. what? You both have the time. What's that, David? <laughs> we have a question from John uh, Colleen. Any recollections of Norm MacDonald? And his roast appearances. <laughs> oh, thank me. God you it interrupted just my the wrong way. <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought I'd get. I thought I'd finish telling you about USC, but that's clearly we're, we're, we're running out of time. Um, I met him backstage at the Mark Twain Prize. Uh, the one that I worked on was honoring David Letterman, and Norm was one of the presenters. He did a very funny, obviously very funny thing. Um, he has a lot of like well had i'm sorry r.i.p why did a, something happen a lot of chronic pain <laughs> yeah um but he made this big show of like getting up and like being gentlemanly to like shake my hand and say nice to meet you and i was like oh please don't get up don't get up and he was like mm. um he seemed kind of out of it his manager was like this massive almost fozzy bear looking guy but more like a bro, but he, he looked in his coloring like Fozzie Bear, like he had a giant fuchsia foam the nose. Um, but <laughs> then at some he point he pants. started, he did not wear pants, just a, just a, a short necktie. Right. Um, yeah. But uh, at some point backstage, Norm started complaining about uh, Me Too or something like that. And how like, it was a litigious society and like you're like men were guilty before proven innocent or something. And I was looking and I, I guess my brow was furrowed because the <laughs> Fozzie bear manager man clocked me looking at him talking and literally blocked norms from my view, like stood <laughs> in front of me, like back to my face. That's and I was like, wow. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, <laughs> I went to I went to one of Norm's last shows before lockdown. So one of his last shows ever. And I uh, got to hang out with him in the green room between shows. That was uh, that was pretty great. Yeah, he is that autobiography slash memoir thing is so funny and so brilliant. Yeah. Yeah, dude, I listened to it on a cross country trip. Mm. It was amazing because amazing. I read it first. I read it first. I was like, this is pretty funny. And then I listened to him actually read it out loud and perform it. And there's this great chapter where he's like the 50, be the 50 best weekend update jokes of all time. Mm. And the first one is a Chevy Chase joke about the one about licking a stamp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the next 49 are all Norm jokes. <laughs> and like you kind of like when you hear him read it, it's even funnier because a he's performing the jokes, but also b it's a very slow reveal. You don't get it on the paper of like right. This is 
this is just all norm jokes yeah and like the longer he goes and he really fucking commits to it he does all 50 all 50 jokes and the Amazing. more he does it the funnier it gets one of the, <laughs> we, we have to wrap it up i want to yes. find out about the dog but yeah. to me heaven is watching super dave osborne bob what bob einstein what was who what was his bob einstein bob einstein einstein albert brooks's brother on norm's talk show being read these oh my Ooh, god look oh at this my god there. who this, oh my god that's a oh my god uh, that's What's julie uh, her name I'm, is julie are you Julie? keeping her? Julie's yes. a big girl. We're fostering Julie's a big her. Girl. But are you keeping hey, Julie. her? Yes. Oh my God. I'm meeting you for long. how old? Uh somewhere between seven and ten. We have to take her back to the vet for like a more in-depth oh, checkup. She looks like a puppy. Oh she my is, God. She looks like, she looks She's like the ultimate sweetums. I need yeah. to, I need We're fattening her up so we can eat her. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> oh my god i need to go for a walk with you guys yes I, that is oh my god just the cutest Wait, oh. she's she's between seven and ten years old mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. so what you're not fostering it you're you she owns you she's fostering you she right? owns us now yeah we're just her servants yeah well, you know, hang on for way, one second. Uh, you're not fostering her. That's your your part. No, your we've partner. we've we've had her for five days through a fostering thing up in Inwood here in our neighborhood. Right. But tonight we're having a phone call, actually, like in about one minute, where we're going to talk about the logistics of actually adopting her and whatnot. Ah. Uh, yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. That, that is just breathtaking. That is. Yay. That is, congratulations, breathtaking. I love your show, man. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I can't thank hear you. you. She's got her headphones on. But you're lucky. That, that's why you love it. <laughs> uh, this is this. What a great way to end the week. Thank you so much, Colleen. Thank Congratulations you. Congratulations on Have the a dog. wonderful weekend. Yeah, Happy let's do this Easter. More often. We'll get, Fra I want to get Frank Kahn of Happy Easter. Oh, Liam yeah. Ma Liam McEnany. Upgrade. Plug away. Everybody plug your, your, whatever you want to plug. I got nothing going on. Nothing but a dog. Uh -huh. Well, that's I'm all you filming, need. I'm filming my short film the next couple of weekends, uh, starting okay. tomorrow. Uh, and that's it. I have a show May 24th at the Improv. Put yeah, that in right. your calendars now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye, guys. Bye, bye. bye. Soon, Colleen. Colleen, I'm going to call you the next week. Okay, cool. Bye. Thank you. Great.